Let's go, Gales. The championship of the WCC of the West Coast Conference was on Tuesday night, and the champion, both regular season and tournament, were the St. Mary's Gales. Welcome all in, everybody, for the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. I'm Zach Farmer. The regular season is done. The conference tournament is done. We know we're going to have two teams in the NCAA tournament, but for the next week, the bragging rights goes to the tournament champions, the regular season champions, the coaches predicted champion, St. Mary's. And this championship game did was really everything that we kind of hoped for. It was tight early. It was a good game throughout. St. Mary's did start to pull away there in the second, but Gonzaga made a run, came back. We'll get into all that and just kind of how it all went down. But big picture, uh, we got to see uh, what St. Mary's could still potentially do in the NCAA tournament, a little bit of it. Because obviously there were questions about whether or not they could come back after losing the Gonzaga just 10, day, 10 days prior to the title game. There were questions whether or not they could still hang with a with a tournament quality team without Josh Jefferson. There was qu- questions whether or not they could do it without both he and Harry Wessels. Those question those questions I think got answered on Tuesday. Uh, before we do anything else, uh, remember uh, to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Um, follow it. Follow the podcast on your favorite streaming service, and then of course. Uh, hit that uh, follow button on social media at Post by Zach. All right. So in this game, this was very early. This was a St. Mary's defensive clinic. Uh, It was really early on. uh, They caused four Gonzaga turnovers within the first few minutes, took a nine-point lead after only a couple of 15 to six at one point. Graham E.K. picked up a couple of early fouls and had to go to the bench. This was looking like a game that St. Mary's might actually start to pull away and turn this into a laugh or to a moment. But of course, you you knew Gonzaga was going to come back. You knew that they were going to make a run. And and they did in this game. Ended up tying it at 25 with 248 left in the half. And we also saw in in this tournament, Gonzaga close well. We saw them close out USF in that first half well and ended up taking a lead in that one before they hit the break. But that didn't happen in this game. In fact, the opposite happened. It was St. Mary's that came out and finished the half strong. They got threes from Aiden Mahaney, Augustus Marshall Lonis, and they were the ones who took a four-point lead into the break. And coming out, I mean, Gonzaga did look a little bit, not lethargic, but they didn't have quite that fire or energy that we're kind of used to seeing from that group. Anton Watson was definitely um, one guy who was bringing that energy early on, had that kind of still that zag swagger we're used to seeing. He and Aiden Mahaney at the end of the first half kind of started getting into a little bit of a join uh, competition, a little bit more Aiden Mahaney than it was Anton Watson. But uh, they had some words right before the half, so you kind of knew it was like, all right, this game is gonna, this is gonna be chippy. I think all the way through, this is going to remain a good one. It's going to remain a close one. And it had also been talked about. I had talked about how there maybe the the results of some of the individual awards might play a factor in this one. And how we have seen in the past. Uh, players kind of use that as motivation, extra motivation, once they get into these sorts of environments. But that is not what we saw coming out the half. It was act- it was St. Mary's again who really stepped on the- stepped on the pedal. Uh, they pushed the- it out to a three to an eleven point lead after a back to back threes from Aiden Mahaney. They start eleven. Up that uh, second half on an eleven to four run, uh, the Zags did make a push again, and like as kind of like we saw, like every, Gonzaga would make a run, but every time Gonzaga would make a run, St. Mary's would answer right back, and Gonzaga did eventually take a lead, uh, fifty two fifty one, but 
it was a short-lived lead. Uh, that thing did not last long. I think it lasted for all of like one possession where St. Mary's immediately answered, retook the lead, and then never gave it up. They continued to push. They continued to uh, really kind of like stretch this lead out. At some point late in this game, they were still up by 10, 11, and they ended up winning this game 69 to 60. Augustus Marshallonis was the most outstanding player. Uh, both Aiden Mahaney and Mitchell Saxon were all uh, tournament players as well. This game, like they were plus 17 in the rebounding column. They were 11 to four in second chance points, both pretty similar to the game in Moraga, but a couple of key differences in this one. And really it was looking at the, the points in the paint and then also the fast break points. Points in the paint, Gonzaga had a huge advantage in the in the last matchup in Moraga. 42 to 26 was the advantage in that one. But it was dead even in this one, 32-32. Fast break points. Gonzaga really took it to St. Mary's on that front. In the in the last regular season matchup, 15 to 3, 4 to 4 in this contest. You really kind of got to see some of the best of St. Mary's in this one. Uh, Aiden Mahaney with 23 points. Augustus Marshallone is 13 points, eight, eight assists, two blocks, two steals, and eight assists with only one turnover in this one. Mitchell Saxon with 19 points, 15 rebounds. For Gonzaga, I mean, it's not like that they didn't, weren't getting production from places either. Anton Watson had 18.7 rebounds. Uh, Ryan Emmard, 13 and 11. Graham E.K. was held to 10 points, 5 rebounds in 19 minutes of play in this one. He was in foul trouble almost the entire game. Uh, and the Zag shot 2 for 11 from 3. Just uh, just a combination of things that, just, that were going to just prevent the Zags from winning a contest against a team like St. Mary's. So this was a this was kind of like the 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 finishing touch on a season for St. Mary's. Not quite the finishing touch, obviously they have the NCAA tournament, but when you think about what some of the goals were for this squad, they won the the WCC tournament for the first time since 2019. Fourth tournament title for Randy Bennett, fifth overall for St. Mary's. It was the first time that the Gales had won the regular season title and the tournament title in the same season since 2012. They held Gonzaga to a season low 60 points. And more than so that you checked off the regular season championship, you checked off the tournament championship, an outright regular season championship, I should say. So, they have done everything to this point that they have kind of set out to do. And now they look forward to the NCAA tournament. And I think what this game really showed, at least in my mind, was what they are capable and what the, maybe the ceiling is without the likes of Josh Jefferson and Harry Wessels. To be able to show that they are able to win against tournament-level teams even without two of their top seven rotation players. Mason Forbes stepped up in a, in a big way in this tournament. He had 18 in that semifinal game. He had eight critical points in the game on Tuesday night against Gonzaga. His defense, his act, his cuts and actions toward the basket really gave them a different dynamic that they had, that they really didn't utilize all too much with um, Jefferson. And he is the rim runner that we're not used to seeing a St. Mary's team have. Now, he did hit the floor pretty hard uh, there in the second half of that game. Uh, so, And he didn't return. He did return. He had to come out. He did go to the back for a little bit, but he did return to the bench. So there is hoping uh, that he is going to be able to be good, and good to go for the NCAA tournament as well. A long time off before having to play another game. Obviously, for St. Mary's, it'll either be that's going to be a full almost 10 days, 9, 10 day rest before they have to hit the court again. 
And it and there is the chance that we're also going to see Harry Wessels back for the NCAA tournament. He did not play in either of the two games uh, St. Mary's played in Vegas, but he was in uniform. He was suited up. He was doing some light warm up drills with the team in before both of those contests. So it's not. It is. It is very possible that we will see him as an active player in that tournament. Now, it is a huge lift for St. Mary's and does give them a different dynamic. It does add, add to the depth that they have. and also gives Terry, uh, Mitch, uh, Mitchell Saxon that much-needed backup that he, he does need and will need in the NCAA tournament. Uh, because, as we know, if they, especially if they play a bigger team, they get matched up with a bigger squad, they're going to need uh, more of that size and just more relief. Uh, for him, even though like we saw him play great in this tournament against the 19 and 15 uh, in that championship game, but he wasn't and what I think it was six for 14 from the field. So he didn't shoot great, even though he had some big time numbers uh, in that game. You're, you're going to need the, that depth. You're going to need that um, deeper and deeper in this tournament. And I think that what we have seen from this team does show that they are. I think they were still capable of winning one game in the tournament even before the Gonzaga game I was I was still thinking you know this team is still there's obviously a lot of talent they're still good they're still disciplined they're doing a lot of the things well that will get them through at least one game the what I was starting to look at was well are they capable of doing two before the season I absolutely thought they were capable of getting two games and getting to that second weekend matchup pending of course and after the Jefferson injury, I thought that they were they were playing so well, and he was such a big part of what they did that it was going to be a challenge, a really big uphill climb for them to then get a second game in the tournament. But you know, what we saw on Tuesday, to me, kind of softened some of those those concerns because we got to see them do different things. They played a little bit differently than they did in that game against Gonzaga on, on the second, what they did, what they did in Vegas for the tournament. I really gave them a different wrinkle, gave them a different look that they didn't use a ton, but it was different enough and gave, and gave them a dynamic that they hadn't utilized nearly as much. Having that, Having someone who can play above the rim, having someone who can be kind of like that physical, not quite a brute, but like he can be that Mason Forbes is that sort of guy that can play that style. And of course, now you get Harry Wessels back. Now you're going to have two of those guys who can kind of play play that role um, as that kind of like outlet or like that outlet valve, that steam valve for this squad is because I kind of, you know, like. The four who are going to be the key components to that, it's going to be really critical for those two um, to to be those fillers as well. So as we're looking at where this team is going to be, where St. Mary's is going to be come the tournament, they'll probably be a six seed. They're, they're, they're anywhere. I've seen them as high as a five. I've seen them as low as a seven. I... It feels like a 6-7 is probably right. CBS does have them as a 6. ESPN also moved them up to a 6 as, as of uh, this week after the win. So that's probably about where they're going to end up. They're 20 in Ken Palm. They're 15 in the net. They're 5-3 and one Q, five and three in Q1, 8-5 and five in Q1, Q2. A regular season championship, a tournament championship. They have beaten... At this stage, it's going to be four tournament quality teams in their in their season as they've gotten closer and closer to um, to selection Sunday. And it is kind of crazy that this team is back to where they are now because the expectations before the year are this. They're exactly where a lot of the expectations were before the year. And while there, it was a roller coaster of a season, them getting those first couple games, beating New Mexico, and was looking really strong at the start. And then things just unraveled there toward the end of November and early December. 
the loss to San Diego State, the loss to Xavier, the loss to Weber State. It it started to everything started to fall apart, and it looked and myself included, and many others across the country, in Gale Nation, wherever. It was oh no, they're they're not going to be that good. They may not actually be tournament good after all. And then they went on a run that no St. Mary's team has ever done. They finished they finished the season what? Like that they, they were three and five at that point. They finished the season twenty six and seven. So you go twenty three and two over your last twenty five games is just an incredible turnaround. And we knew this team had the talent. We knew this team was going to be good. They hit a, it wasn't a bad patch. It was a, it was a horrible patch. They could not shoot at all in that, late in that month, in early December. It was, it was as bad as it gets. And you saw the light click for Augustus Marshallonis in that Boise State game. You, I think you saw the light click for Josh Jefferson in the Colorado State game. You saw some of the other players start to fill their roles. Luke Barrett filling his role. Uh, you started to see Alex Dukas get healthy, which has been a big part of what is I think we've seen happen, especially since conference play started. You started to see... The other guys, Harry Wessel, start to fill his role. We started to see more, more and more out of Mason Forbes. Uh, we got to see bits and pieces of what uh, Chris Howell can do. Like there was a lot of, there was. It took some time, but they are now right where we started, or right where we thought they would be. They're going to be in the NCAA tournament. They're going to get a single-digit seed. And I think that's where a lot of the expectations still were going in. And that's exactly where they are five months later. For Gonzaga. Yes, it did not go well on Tuesday night. Held to a season low 60 points. Not good. They didn't seem to come out with the same fire that we had seen over the last two months. Definitely not the same fire that we saw in Moraga. But all that said, they still had their chances in that game. They only turned the ball over seven times, even after they turned it over four times in the first few minutes. They were two for 11 and only lost by nine. They had a bad shooting night from Ryan Nemhart, and they only lost by nine. Graham E.K. was in foul trouble the entire night. They lost by nine. There were a lot of things that did not go their way. And yes, maybe you can, you can make the case that St. Mary's forced them into these situations. But this is still a good Gonzaga team that play, has played two incredibly strong months of basketball going into that. They didn't shoot well. They didn't rebound well. They were forcing the tough shots most of the night. All that said, this game doesn't really, it's not going to impact their seeding in the NCAA tournament all that much. It might slightly. And there was, al there was already some conversation going into the game of like where they would be. At I mean, now, granted, there were those who said like, oh, they could even jump up to a five seed had they uh, beaten St. Mary's on Tuesday. Obviously, that won't be happening anymore. And it does look like a six seed is probably not likely anymore either. But talking with, and some of the conversations with uh, Rocco Miller, um, bracketologist at bracketeer.org, some of the things that he mentioned about that situation, at least going into that game, was both of those squads were kind of like on that 6-7 line already, St. Mary's and Gonzaga. And whoever won that game, probably that's kind of how it would go. It would be 6-7. If St. Mary's won, they're the 6, Gonzaga's the 7. If Gonzaga won, it'd be they're the 6, and St. Mary's is the 7. As it is, we saw St. Mary's win this game. They look like they are a strong case for a 6 seed. 
Gonzaga looks like they're probably a solid seven. I've seen CBS did put them down as an eight, which I think would be an awful place for them to be. But a seven seems about right uh, for the season that this team has had, how well they have played down the stretch, the metrics that all positively show how good this Gonzaga team still is. One of the better offensive efficiency teams in the country. They are still, they still, I think it was what the bet, the most efficient offensive team uh, in WCC play ever was this year. And that's kind of, that's a crazy thought to think when you think about some of the Gonzaga teams that we've seen over the years, there's still the ninth best adjusted offensive team on Ken Palm. This is still an elite offensive team when they're playing well. And I don't think we saw them play well on Tuesday. They're still 15th in Ken Palm. They're still 17th in the net. Three and six in quad one, seven and seven overall quad one, quad two. Yes, there probably will be some scoreboard watching for the Zags going into this weekend. A little bit just to kind of see like who's going to be able to help them. The USC did get pummeled tonight by Arizona, so that does not help. Uh, but they're going to need some. They're going to need, I think, some. I don't know if it's chalky things that need to happen, but they do need some teams that either they have already beaten to keep playing well, or they're going to need. Uh, some of those bubbled teams to hold on uh, to kind of bump. Actually, they might. Yeah, they're going to need some of those bubble teams to do what they need to do and actually handle their business and bump them up. Albeit, so, there have been a fair number of bubble teams that have already kind of put themselves in a precarious position. Indiana State comes to mind. But this is, again, it's not about whether in or out. This is about how far up some of these other games might be able to nudge the Zags up that up that chart. And the tournament ex- expectations for for the Zags. Now, again, I'm all, I'm always thinking about when I think tournament expectations, best case scenario. Not lucky like a like a 15 seed beats a 2 and then you get to play the 15 seed. Not that sort of thing, but if if there is chalk along the way, who are the teams? What are the seed lines that might actually work out well for Gonzaga? Will work out well for these teams? Are should they should they win their first game? I think that's. Pr- I don't think there's going to be many teams on that ten line, that ten, that nine ten line that I think that Gonzaga is not going to be able to handle. I think they're going to be pretty safe on that front. It does become a little sketchier when you start to think about that next one. There are a few two seeds that I think are going to be uh, more challenging. I You still see Arizona hovering at that two line. Uh, you still see the likes of North Carolina hovering around there. Now, depending on how they do in the ACC tournament, maybe just maybe they can do enough to sneak up to a one. Uh, but right now, they do look like they're probably they're probably going to hu- be kind of like stu- be stuck at that two seed line. But if they slip to an eight, that's where I think it gets really rough. That's where they could be in danger because the one seeds and one of them being UConn, we've already seen what Gonzaga looks like against a team like that. Now that was a Gonzaga team that was not the same Gonzaga team that we have seen for the la- again for the last few months this is a better Gonzaga team than the one that played Yukon in Seattle this is a better team than what saw St. Mary's in Moraga i that i think that's the things you have to start to think about with this Gonzaga team now matchups obviously matter Houston i think is going to be a rough one because that is a very similar uh matchup defensively as you would see against St. Mary's physical tough but they are more athletic. They are a better offensive team than St. Mary's is. Uh, so that would be a that would be a tough challenge. So there there's a few matchups that just do not favor Gonzaga, just being style of play or just being uh, the athleticism or talent level of some of the other squads that we've seen at the top level of college basketball. 
I still thought going into the year that this was a team that while they had questions was still a second weekend team. I still think it's a very solid possibility that they advance to their ninth straight Sweet 16. They know what to do when they get here. They've done it before. They have players who have done it before. And, but this is going to be the first weekend in a while, the first tournament weekend in a while where there's going to be less confidence and more, not uneasiness, but things will have to fall the right way for Gonzaga to get out of that first weekend and move on to the Sweet 16. Is it possible? Absolutely. It is absolutely possible that Gonzaga can do it. Do I think they're going to? I'm probably putting it now closer to like a 25-ish percent chance, maybe even maybe like 15% chance that they advance to the second weekend. Possible? Absolutely. Do I think they're going to do it? I also think it's, I think it's just not, not likely, but I will never count the Zags out when it comes to the tournament because they have been automatic for near a decade getting to that second weekend. A couple of notes, uh, sub- some other things that uh, we talked about, Gonzaga talked about St. Mary's. Uh, Pepperdine w- was uh, very active over the weekend. Well, I don't know if Miss Pepperdine was active, but a lot of their players were active, or now former players. Houston Millette has was already announced to have hit the portal. Javon Porter also on that list of players that have now decided to uh, part ways. I've also seen the also seen Michael Ajayi, uh, the trans the transfer who came in just a year ago. He will be hitting the portal as well. Uh, and then there is one more, and I'm now trying to actually find it. I think it's uh, Jalen Petrie being the other, the fourth. Uh, player. Let's see. Hold on. I think it, so did I had Peach. I also see it was Malik Moore. So we're seeing a lot of guys uh, start to hit that portal, hit that, sh- hit that point of the season. And we knew this was going to happen with Pepperdine. A lot of guys were going to dip out and, uh, and try their luck elsewhere after uh, Lorenzo Romar was announced to be that he was going to be let go. And it's going to be a challenge for Pepperdine. Like rebuilding that squad is no easy task. Uh, this this is a Pepperdine squad that I mean it's it's clearly possible to recruit to that school. We have already seen it a number of times. A number of guys who have come in and out. And now maybe you kind of point that as like, well, that was Lorenzo Romar, and maybe that's kind. Of, that's where you kind of have to make that case. It's like, well, it's it, who is it? Is it really the program? Is it the coach? It's, I mean, it's almost always the coach. But that said, I think you do have to look at... You have to just kind of take a look at who is going to be that next guy. I still think that they're capable of uh, bringing in a more established head coach, which I think would be great for that program. Someone who we know who can recruit but the difference is going to be they need to find an X's and O's guy and there are and I think best bet is probably to look outside the conference I know that there are some uh, who will say oh no you should like there are some good young coaches in the league and there are a lot of good young coaches inside the WCC but I just look at this squad and think that they need to look outside uh, this grouping because to build it faster, I think you need someone more established. I know there have been a lot of like rumors out there of who it could be and whatnot, but still very early on in this process. But but Pepperdine probably feels like one of those teams that's going to get it done sooner rather than later on finding a head coach. We know Pacific is also still looking for their next head coach as well, so we'll have to kind of wait and see on on them. All right, I'm just looking through, and I'm just trying to confirm. All right, the ones I was able to find, just as an FYI, confirm of the Pepperdine transfers. Uh, Houston Houston Millette has been reported out there as being one. Do have Michael Ajayi, Javon Porter, and then the other one is Malik Moore. So those are the four that I can, that I have seen that I can confirm reports on. Uh, 
that are le that will be leaving Pepperdine and moving elsewhere. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. The select the the March Madness selection show is on Sunday at three o'clock. I'll be heading over to St. Mary's to watch it in Moraga at U at UCU Pavilion. It has been a great season to this point. For those of you who are fan or fans of some of the other teams uh, and are kind of starting to check out on the season, I am. So happy to have had you all year long. I hope you we have I have you back next season. That it'll be great um, for the USF people. I'm not like I'm as I started to think about it. Like, I don't want to completely neglect all the USF fans out there because obviously you guys are probably not done yet either. Uh, I'm gonna have to wait until Sunday also to find out about the NIT chances for the Dons. I'm very confident that that USF will end up uh, playing in that tournament as it is now reformatted again for the second straight year so this is going to be an interesting uh tournament for that team i do think that there's a good shot that they go deeper into this tournament i think it's one of those it's we haven't seen us be able to kind of get over the hump against the the good to great teams but these aren't the good to great teams these are the good teams and some of them are mediocre teams. So I think that's what I think USF has a much better chance of like getting deeper into this tournament. And that's a shot that they could actually win it. Like add, add a banner right next to uh, Bill Russell's NIT banner from back in the day. All right. So again, um, for any, for everybody who has been hanging out, hanging on and been here all season long. I want to thank you for, to the Pepperdine fans, to the, the Pacific fans, LMU, San Diego, uh, Santa Clara, <laughs> um, the USF fans. I'm hoping that you'll stick around because obviously we have the NIT still to do. St. Mary's Gonzaga. We have hopefully plenty of basketball still left to talk about in the coming weeks. Uh, be sh be sure to hit subscribe on the, on the YouTube channel, favorite on your favorite streaming services, and then also follow on on social media at Post by Zach. It's been a fun season. The season continues. We have a, we have basketball for at least two more teams, hopefully three. Uh, but we'll get into all of that next week as we find out where St. Mary's is going, where Gonzaga is going, and hopefully where USF is going. All right. One more time. Uh, that that's the end of this one. Um, thanks everybody for uh, listening, and I will catch you later. Mm.